all in our hands. Has been paid for by the WZWA Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Insider's Edge podcast here on the WZWA Network. I'm your host with the most on the West Coast, California Imperial. It's a joy to be with you all once again. Uh, I have COVID at the moment, so I'm very unwell. um, And I've been having some computer issues. So I'm opening up this episode here a little differently, okay? Because I'm going back, I'm digging back into the vault on the WZWA network. And I found a lost episode that we never actually put out, uh, which was recorded on July 27th, 2020 with the one and only Big Vito. Now I have to let you all know, this was during the very early days of the podcast. So the video quality won't be as good as this. The audio quality is gonna be pretty bad too, uh, from what you're used to anyway. Um, So, and of course at that time, I was still just getting my feet wet uh, when it came to, uh, you know, hosting a podcast and interviewing professional wrestlers. So you'll probably see a, a bit of a dip in quality with, uh, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to me and my performance, but I think you'll enjoy it anyway. Uh, the reason why this is a lost episode uh, that was never released was because, uh, fortunately, nearly about an hour into this interview, uh, Big Vito uh, was called away to a family emergency, so we could not complete the interview uh, that night, and uh, I've been trying to reorganize uh, to finish off the interview since then, which is like two and a half years ago. Uh, but he's just too busy, and we just haven't been able to line it up. So, because this week I haven't been well, um, I figured, hey, let's use this opportunity to release this last episode of the Insiders Ed podcast, my exclusive interview with the one and only Big Vito. He's a former WCW hardcore and tag team champion, a uh, member of the full-blooded Italians and the Paisans, not the Mamelukes. It is the one and only Big Vito. How you going, Vito? How's everything? Thank you very much for having me on the show. I got up early, was in the gym, got my pool aerobics in. And you know how it is being the B-I-G-V from the L-O-G, just <laughs> doing my thing here on this podcast. So... I understand one of your colleagues is sick, you know, is under the weather, he's got the sniffles, he crawled in bed with his mom. That's okay, everybody's <laughs> got their thing. But hey, let's have a great interview. What do you got for me today? Go ahead and shoot. All right, Vito. Well, I really appreciate that. And I really like the fact that you took a dig at my co-host because uh, that means a lot to me. Um, I, uh, well, I, I mean, want... when, you're, when you're still sleeping with your mom, I mean, you know, things are <laughs> things have got to be called out. You know what I'm saying? Especially when you hang out with a couple of paisans like us. You know, Absolutely. we can't have that. You know, we Absolutely. can't have that. Absolutely. No. Um, I, I, I usually start these interviews, Vito, with the same question. And, and that's, you know, how did you become a wrestling fan? Huh, how did I become? I used to watch it as a kid. I grew up watching it. Um, WOR Channel 9. And then, uh, you know, I just uh, stayed up late, watched TV, and then, you know, I took it from there. I guess I'm just like everybody else. You just watch the TV and see what you like, and it's something that, you know, it's a sport that back then you really believed in. Absolutely. Um, so how old would have you been about then? Boy, are you talking like, uh, I guess a kid like nine, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. So okay. Grew up watching that era. Was, was wrestling cool in school? Uh, wrestling was, you know, it was okay. I mean, I used to portray Chief J. Strombo and bounce off the gates in the schoolyard. I used to get my tail kicked quite often. The Chief J. didn't work for me back then. So, I mean, it was okay. But everybody believed back then it was real. There were real men bodies with real life, you know. There was no mistake in if you were a wrestler or not. You just believed in it. Absolutely. I mean, when I, when I was uh, first become a wrestling fan, it was like 1998, 1999. So 
in a you know a city like Perth, Western Australia, it's the most isolated city in the world, really. And and it, for it to be extremely cool to be a wrestling fan um, for me back then, that was an exciting time for me. But uh, I like to hear what um, you know other people's surroundings were when they were, you know, just becoming a wrestling fan. I I, I find it interesting. Um, so when you, uh, I guess you become a teenager, you start to become a young man. What point do you start to think, okay, uh, I want to give this a go. I want to start doing some training. Well, I guess it was uh, after. I mean, my first love was basketball. I was, uh, I was Division One, uh, Division One worthy of scholarships. My grades weren't good enough. I wound up going to community college, and uh, I tried out for the Olympic baseball team. That didn't work out. Then I went to do. I was coming home and I was going to play semi-pro football with the Bulldogs on Staten Island. Okay. And then, uh, you know, I was watching TV one day. I said I could do better than these guys. And I went to Johnny Rods' school at Gleason's gym. And, uh, you know, off I went. Wow. So um, what was your experience like with the training? At, um... It was different because I'd never been physical. And, you know, I was just a ball player. Wow. So actually getting in there, uh, you know, you're in there with guys who are already, you know, uh, you know, had more experience than I was. Some guys were veterans. A lot of guys had amateur backgrounds. I had nothing. I learned from scratch. You know, I learned, uh, you know, how to become an amateur wrestler. I learned how to become a pro wrestler all from scratch. It was I had no knowledge of wrestling or right. MMA or boxing or anything like that. It, was it was the situation similar to a lot of other uh, guys who got in around the same time you did? For the first, I guess, maybe few weeks or few months, they're just beating the shit out of you, and then eventually they start to let you know what you know how to actually wrestle. No, I mean at Johnny's school, it was pretty much you learn the basics and his repetition, and the guys they were hard on you, but they didn't look to hurt you. They were just you know to see if they could break you if you were tough. You know, and like they used to try to get me to tap out, rip my shirt off. And I never used to quit and I even used to tap out. So, I mean, it was uh, to them, it was a challenge. And then once I finally started to learn how to wrestle, nobody wanted to wrestle with me anymore. So it was like, okay, all right, he's in. He knows, he knows what he's doing now. All right, stay away from him. So but it was all fun. It was good. Good training. That's good. So you earned your stripes, you got in, and um, then obviously it's it's getting to that point now where you're going to work your first matches. Um, you know, where where was your first match, and, and, and how was that situation? I believe it was in Boston, and my first, my first match ever, pro match, was against Tommy Dreamer, who wrestled as Bobby Ocean. So we were from the same school. And uh, on the card, when I walked in the dress room, you had the Wild Samoans, uh, Ken Patera, uh, Nikolai Volkov, the Iron Sheik, S.D. Jones, Johnny Rods. And you're walking in there as a kid and you're looking at all these big men and you're like, wow. You know, so it was a, a wow factor. And, uh, but they all treated me good, you know, and uh, you know, you're you respectful of the game. They see you trying, you're training. You know, if you're one of Johnny's boys back then, you know, if he puts you on a show, you earned your way on the show. You didn't just put uh, anybody on show, so it was good. Right. I mean, you, you, you're keeping some pretty uh, epic company there, um, <laughs> straight out of the bat, um, straight off the bat. I mean, um, you. So you you begin as Skull Von Crush. Is that your first character or gimmick that you utilized? Yep, Skull Von Crush, all the way to uh, where I broke into uh, my first TV match, which was WCW, where I wrestled Bobby Eaton. And then I got the call to go to WWF TVs. And, uh, you know, that was an experience too, because there I am wrestling the pros. I'm not necessarily wrestling um, guys at my level. I'm wrestling the pros in the big leagues. And these guys were teaching me. So, I mean, I got the best education, you know, up there. And uh, it helped groom me to become who I became in the wrestling world. Right. Um, I wanted to scale back before you got to the WWF. I was interested in hearing about your early career. You, you spent some time in Japan. Is that correct? Yes. In my first year, I was in WWF. And in my second year, I was, went to Japan for NOW and I was in Puerto Rico. So you're talking right out of the box. I accomplished 
three things that most people don't ever get to do one. Yeah. I did all three in my first two years. <laughs> that must have spun you out, you know. That's, that's just crazy. Yeah, I mean, but like there are goals and there are places you want to go and there was a, a regime and a regimen that you followed. And a lot of those things today that people don't follow them because you have the performance center, you have developmental ter territories, you have schools who have TVs of all this stuff. And back then you had to earn your keep. You didn't get paid to train. You learned on the job. And that yeah. was probably the best education you can get. Absolutely. Um, and I wanted to talk about the 30th of September, 1991 in uh, Salisbury, Maryland, uh, where you worked with Bobby Eaton. Um, so how did the, the, was it a tryout? Was, is this what that was? Or was it just a, a dark match or something? No, um, Johnny had told me that they uh, he had a spot at WCW. He said, go to Baltimore, Maryland. Um, or they're going to put you on a card. And uh, I went there, you know, and that first guy I meet, you know, I met, uh, oh, man, I met Paul Lee for the first time. I met Lex Luger and the Steiners. And I'm doing my German gimmick, and I wrestled beautiful Bobby. And, uh, you know, they all knew I was Johnny, Johnny Rod's a student. They asked me how long I've been wrestling. I said a year. And, uh, and uh, they liked me. And, uh, you know, I was just an extra on TV. It was for a good showing. It wasn't a bad match. And for a young guy being on TV in front of a live crowd like that, that early in my career, I think I handled it pretty well. Excellent. Well, that's cool. I mean, and working with Bobby Eaton, who without a doubt has probably one of the best working punches in the business. Um, you know, that, that, that's almost a day off. No, it definitely was. You know, him, him and Buddy Landell, that's where I got my punch from. I considered those two guys to have the best punches in the business. And it wasn't until I was in Puerto Rico for Carlos Cologne and Buddy Landell was there. I said, Buddy, I love the way you and Bobby Eaton throw a punch. You mind if I try using it? He says, no, go ahead. So I started doing it in Puerto Rico and uh, I kept it ever since. Right. Yeah. No, I've always loved your work in punch too, man. Uh, uh, obviously I'm a big Thank fan. You. So, um, so uh, nothing comes of that uh, experience in WCW it was just, just to do what you did and, and, that, and that was it. And then the WWF called you. Right. You know, it, it's not that they didn't pursue it. It's just that I never called again. And being that I didn't know what to do and I was young in the business and, you know, you go where they tell you, they call you. And then as I progressed, that's when they said, you know, call the office, see if they have anything for you, you know, and, and then they'll call you when they're on the East Coast. What do you got going on? You know, and that's how I started getting booked for the WC, WWE, the WWF. And then they just started book, booking me for all their TV. So it was a pretty cool thing. Right. Um, and I'm, I want to list these guys that you work with just for our listeners uh, that won't be aware, but you got to work with the Rockers, Bret Hart, Virgil, Big Boss Man, British Bulldog, The Undertaker, The Legion of Doom, Tatanka, Typhoon, and Owen Hart and Coco Beware, just to name a few. That's, that's just you, uh, such a learning experience for you, right? Let me tell you something. I wrestled Tatanka four times. I wrestled Bret Hart four times. Um, so you put together all those matches and um, you're talking about some of them were on live on the Manhattan Center on Monday nights and uh, a lot of more TV tapings. But the experience of wrestling with those, that group and that caliber of worker, that taught me a lot about the business. It really did. Absolutely. And man, I mean, just as a fan, like thinking about the fact that, you know, in such an early part of your career, you get to wrestle Bret Hart. I mean, that is just so, uh, you know. For the title. For the title. <laughs> Excellent. You even got a title shot. That's great. Um, what was the, the company like behind the scenes when you were there? Uh, being that I never was in a company before, it's kind of hard to explain. I thought it was, I thought it was you know, pretty big time. You know, business as usual, it was like what you see on, you know, what you hear about and, you know, from what they tell you. And you just go, you act like one of the boys, you go in the dress room, you act accordingly. You know, it's the things that Johnny taught you and, you know, it transpired into walking in there. They never made me change in the, in the hallway. They never treated me like a jabron. 
They're all treating me with respect and dignity. And I appreciate that from all the guys who I work with. Because uh, if it wasn't for them treating me like that, you know what I mean? It gave me an edge and a head start in the business and how to be a pro. Awesome, man. Um, you move on from your time there and you move on to the USWA, um, Skull Von Crush. Moves into Memphis. Um, you know, how did that opportunity come about? I had just finished my tour of Santa Domingo wrestling for Jack Veneno in uh, w, WCW there. And Jack Veneno was a legend there, just like Carlos Colon in Puerto Rico. So um, we had to call in Jerry Lawler, and it was about Christmas time. I had been calling. Honky Tonk Man was calling for me. Um, uh, Kamala was calling for me. Coco Beware was calling for me. And then finally, Lawler said, okay, why don't you come on down? Merry Christmas. I'll see you January uh, 7th or whatever and be in Memphis, Tennessee. So there I went, and I went to Memphis. Wow, cool. So you just packed everything up and moved over to Memphis? Moved over to Memphis. That's cool, man. Um, and I guess you, you did work with Lawler a bit there. How was that experience working with Jerry? It was all the best because I went from the bottom to the top. I work with all the greats. I work with Lawler, the Boogie Woogie Man, the Dream Machine, the Moon Dogs, PG-13, Brian Christopher, um, you know, the Spellbinder. Uh, I worked in the first Memphis Memory Show where I learned a lot about wrestling history and Southern wrestling, where everybody goes through. And the old saying was, if you don't go through Memphis, you're never making it to the WWE. And you had to go through Memphis. That's the truth. Right, yeah. Memphis was very connected with the WWF at that point. Um, I know that they, I guess loosely they were affiliated as kind of a developmental place that they would send guys uh, or, um, you know, loan guys if they weren't doing anything with them on TV. Um, do you have any like fun stories, I guess, from your time in Memphis? And, and, and I mean, and Memphis is such a, a, a wonderful city. Uh I got to tell you, it was a great experience, especially being in the high profile feud be between the Lawlers and the Gilberts. And if you look on YouTube and you, you know, you get the Lawler Gilberts, you see Skullbound Crush running down the aisle with the key to unlock everybody. And, you know, that's probably part of, that's part of wrestling history, people. And at the time, you don't know it, but when you look back and they make that focal point of Memphis Coliseum, and the Lawlers and the Gilberts and their Skull Von Crush coming running down the aisle, you're like, all right, so you're part of history. Um, I guess the fun stories, I guess just learning on the road, traveling with the guys, everybody jamming in one car, um, going around, learning the road, like on the, really, really on the road in like Memphis. And you're talking about Elvis Presley, Graceland, you know, yeah. you know food, food fights on the road. <laughs> but I think I think working with the Rock and Roll Express, the Gilberts, PG-13, and, um, you know, people of that nature, and they showed you Memphis-style wrestling and a different psychology. I mean, that was, like, part of the greatest thing, and that actually helped me become World Tag Team Champion in WCW because if I didn't have that kind of knowledge, you know, you don't move up the change, you don't move up the ladder, you know, because then when I moved on to uh, Carlos Colon, you know, eventually, you know, I was wrestling as a single and then they had me in some tags, but it wasn't until I went to ECW where I, I got, you know, where I had a good singles run and they put me with the Baldies. And then I said, okay, guys, just trust me. This is the way we have to do it. And the guys trusted me. We had the same walk. We had the same look. We all, we, we went in as a team. We left as a team. We have good tag team chemistry, you know, and going through the ranks in ECW, I mean, that was a different kind of culture. You know, we all train together, we eat together, we fight together. And it was like a more family knit atmosphere. And going to WCW, when I got to be with Johnny the Bull, you're talking about eight years of me, you know, going back and forth to Puerto Rico, you know, having a, a, a bunch of tours of Japan, being in all Japan, working for the best wrestling company at the time in 1998, before I went to uh, ECW, and um, having a, a historic event where I pinned the great Mizawa in a yeah. battle royal, you know, and then being in a bunch of high profile matches. So, I mean, I did my full, you know, take, 
you know, going full circle, but I still wasn't anywhere yet till I got to WCW. Talking about eight years of grooming yeah. and training and learning. When I got to ECW, you know, it was starting all over again. Everything you walk in the door, ego aside, attitude's got to be in check. You got to earn your keep. And I earned my keep there. And, you know, that was a great experience for me because it helped me move on to WCW where they gave me Johnny the Bull, who was just out of the power plant. Yeah. And being out of the power plant, you had Tony Mameluke also. And they trusted me enough to guide them. And, you know, the giant and I had good chemistry. He trusted me. I never all exposed him. And, um, you know, it was a good time. Uh, WCW was, uh, you know, very high profile. You're in competition with the Nitro Wars, with the WWE at the time. And then here we are, tag team champions, the Mama Loops, you know, going against DX when they were tag team champions. And, um, you know, you're in a bunch of magazines. So, you know, me on one side, The Rock on the other, me on one side, Eddie Guerrero on the other. You talk about all the greats. And, uh, you know, the competition of the Nitro Wars is pretty good. Yeah, cool, man. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, back in 1996 when you um, you worked in Puerto Rico. Um, I, I want to know what it's like to to it, Puerto Rico is such a different place than a lot of places, uh, especially in wrestling. Uh, what was that experience like re uh, wrestling in Puerto Rico? And you know, did you have any moments with the crowd that you know? I know that they can be a little bit crazy. Well, people believed back then because those kayfabe was still in effect. And yeah. you lived on the road, you had eight on the road, everything was live TV. It was just like the WWE, you know. So to them, Puerto Rican wrestling was, was great. And then when you got the wrestle calls, Cologne Abdul, the Butcher, or you wrestled with Chicky Star and Savio Vega and, uh, you know, Ricky Santana, you know, uh, 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 just a whole bunch of guys who, who were legendary there. And, you know, you learn kayfabe. I mean, that was another great experience, learning place and a developmental place where you learn the ropes and you learn how to work. You know, it's not like you have, you know, dressing rooms on, you know, one dressing room. You had separate dressing rooms. You got to go know how to go in there and learn how to work with the crowd and learn how to call a match. So, I mean, it was the on the job training that what the wrestlers need today. Absolutely. Um, what was it like working with Carlos Colon? It was a good experience. I mean, he's a, he's a, he was a legend. He was a great, um, uh, he's probably one of the, he's the Hulk Hogan of Puerto Rico. I mean, yeah. working with him, I mean, on a working relationship side, you know, everything was fine. You know, no, no complaints, no complaints at all. Would you say, is there anything in particular that you might've learned from him? Um, Carlos was very fond of me because I was a hard worker and, uh, he liked me very much and just being given the opportunity, uh, to being able to wrestle for three years straight there. Um, again, it was a grooming experience and helped me grow as a wrestler. And, uh, I'm very appreciative of that time. So I can't say it was him tutoring but it was the atmosphere tutoring and the opportunity. Absolutely. Cool. Um, so you, you have mentioned uh, all Japan uh, and I, I just want to know what, what a Japanese tour is like. Um, you know, if you could, you know, take me through a day in the life of, of uh, uh, an American wrestler on tour in Japan. Well, on tour in Japan, you get there, you go to the hotel, you're fighting the time change. And, um, you know, the wrestlers there, they train different, you know, than the American wrestlers. But if you're a student of the game and you go there and you're doing your squats, your push-ups, you're working out before, you're training before, uh, those guys know how to defend themselves and those guys know the basics because that's how they're trained, groomed. Um, if they see that you are afraid or you're scared or you're not tough, they'll take advantage of you, you know? And um, being that I was well-groomed and I could amateur wrestle at that, I learned how to wrestle. So I can amateur wrestle with those guys and just being tough and knowing my craft, those guys respected me and I got to have some great matches. And it was a, it's a regimen that I was accustomed to 
and a regimen that I tried to carry out through my career of uh, getting up, going to the gym, coming back, having something to eat, going to the arena, you know, training before the match, to relax, have your match, get back, go to the hotel, get something to eat, go home. So, I mean, having that regimen is something that's universal and worldwide. If you're lucky enough to get, you know, work on a company and you're working five, six days a week, that's the plan. Right. Uh, what's it like? I mean, now, now you're not, uh, you know, on the road all the time uh, wrestling. What's it like going from that regimen to trying to adjust to just not doing that anymore and doing something else that, it being must be difficult civilian, being a civilian. Yeah, being man. Civilian. I actually enjoy my life more. I live in a beautiful house. I live on a golf course. You know, I'm playing ball again. I go to the gym. Uh, I just started amping my workouts out again. You know what I mean? Because I was playing ball and I was, you know, I was going to the gym, but just doing light stuff. And I just recently started back going hard. And, um, you know, it, I get to enjoy the home life of being relaxed, calm getting a full night's sleep. You know, I get to enjoy time with my wife, uh, family time, enjoy my friends. So it's like having a normal life. When you're in the wrestling business, you got a lot of drama. Uh, you're always intense. You're always on the road. You're always living out of your bag. You're probably not getting a good meal, you know, but, you know, it is a difference. There is a difference. Right. It's just, you, you, to me, you sound like a, a success story because I, I obviously through the years you hear about wrestlers who have a real hard time moving on from the business and, and doing something else. No, and listen, you know, everybody comes from somewhere and you never forget where you came from. And when you start out in life, you know, you got to go to work, got to make money, got to do what you got to do. My work, you know, happened to be wrestling for 20 something years, you know. And then when wrestling wasn't paying the bills, you got to adjust. You can't be that hanger on or to sell a picture and hope to sell something. That yeah. wasn't be, I'm a hustle guy. You know what I mean? I got to work. I got a family support. I want to live good. I like good clothes. I like nice cars. I like nice jewelry. You know, I like to have a nice house. I live in a beautiful place, you know, and you got to work for it. You know, I wasn't, you know, I made, I made money in a business. I saved money and, you know, but I wasn't, you know, how would you say, reckless and careless. And I always took care of myself. Yeah. I look good. I'm in good shape. You know, people ask me, why don't you go back into the ring? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Wrestling business is different. It's not the same as it was. No. And you see everybody in there who, you know, they, didn't, they don't respect the business like I did or the guys who are from my generation did. And they go in there and they think it's a game or you can go in there at 170 pounds and I'm a pro wrestler. Oh, uh, really? Well, congratulations. I'm glad. Welcome to the business, you know? So. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a lot different now because sometimes I watch wrestling and I don't really watch that much anymore. I only watch the old shit, but uh, I watch it. I'm like, man, I, I prefer it when like everyone on my TV, I knew that they could kick my ass. Uh, it, once it gets to the point where I feel like I could take a couple of them, that's when I, it disconnects for me. Yeah, it's different. And you know what's funny? Everybody criticized the Vince Russo era, but what does everybody go watch? The old WWE Attitude era, they go watch the WCW era, they watch the TNA era. Yeah. So I guess that's the era to watch, and we have to thank Vince Russo because he gave us something to look back on. You know, and that's to say, you know, for the territories, like the Carlos Cologne territory, the Jerry Lawler territory, um, the Jack Veneno territory, where the people still believe you know, and it was something that you can believe in when you go over there as a German and a ruthless, you know, and you beat. I mean, when I was in, the, in Santa Domingo for Jack Benino, I beat the whole company. Everybody. I, I mean, I had, I had a Goldberg streak until I met Jack Benino. I lost. Yeah. Now the game plan, you know, build yeah. you up in a monster. And then here comes the champ. Give the champ a little bit of a hard time. And, uh, you know, I eventually pulls it out. The people... You know, cheer, drink sangria, you know, making rice, you know, enjoying the lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? So it's all good. Yeah. Um, before I start talking to you about ECW, I do want to uh, delve into Vince Russo here for a little bit, because I think there's something really interesting that I've noticed when I've been watching all the old stuff. Um, when Vince wrote for the WWF 
and then he left, they still use the same formula that he created with Crash TV and all that stuff. When he went to WCW, he changed the way that they did their shows and wrote it the way that he did it in the WWF. And then when he left for the next three months after it didn't work out at the beginning, they still used the same formula that he was utilizing in those three months that he was there with Ed. So for, for anyone to say that uh, he killed WCW, Vince was the filter, all this stuff, then why are they utilizing the, the method that he created for television? That's just my opinion. It's your opinion, but everybody, everybody likes to knock him. But you see all the heavy hitters who were saying, I'm better than Russo, and I did this. And those, those are all the podcasters, all the bullshitters now. I'm not going to name their names because I get tired of mentioning them. But, you know, all the people who bash Russo have recently been fired by the WWE. So <laughs> we'll just take it from there. I think I know who you're talking about. Um, all right. <laughs> uh, so I want to move on to ECW. Um, how does the, it, that come about that you um, end up getting uh, the call to, to come along? Uh, and I, I was in all Japan. I took my bag afterwards. I still didn't have a job in wrestling full time. So I went there. I spoke to Taz because we were from the same school. He introduced me to Paul Lee, who I already knew. And uh, everybody knew I could wrestle. So it was just a matter of me fitting in, changing my attitudes, and just uh, blending in with the guys, which I did. Right, cool. Um, so like uh, on the 14th of November, 1998 in uh, Fall River, Massachusetts, uh, you make your live event debut against John Cronus. Um, what was, you know, what was it like being in front of an ECW crowd for the first time and how was it working with John? Well, you got to remember, I've been in front of crowds since my first year in the business. So being in front of a crowd really didn't phase me. Working with John Cronus now, that guy was athletic as can be he could he was 280 and he could do flips and he could do uh moon salts and he could do everything and i said i said i love working with this guy he could do everything in here he he had athletic ability that i was at, i was athletic but he could do the things i couldn't do and i used to watch him i'm saying man if that guy got his body in shape and he became jacked oh my god he could be a monster but you know, he, he had a good time. He had a good attitude. He's a really nice guy. And me and him had some really good matches, so I got no complaints from him. Right. Yeah, a, a few guys that I, we've interviewed on the show so far, when they were in ECW, it seemed like most of them, the first person they worked with was John. Um, so that's why he's been brought up so many times. For all of our listeners out there, it just seems like John has been a go-to guy for, um, you know, a, a new talent in ECW to work with. You know, you know what's funny? When you talk about all these matches, I wish I could have copies of some of the stuff that I, you know, because like I know I remember working and I remember the match was good, but actually seeing it and seeing both of us work together and I see a lot of ECW stuff and I'm like, me and Van Damme, me and Taz, you know, you know I see other, me and Carino and I'm like, wow, you know what I mean? I mean, you just look and you could tell I was ready to burst on the scene it was just a matter of just giving me the chance yeah um so uh december 26 98 in new york city your hardcore tv debut was against rob van dam um i haven't had the chance to see the match yet uh i probably should have before i interviewed you but um rob van dam i we just interviewed uh bob holly last week and he said that he was his favorite opponent how was it working with rob Always good. I work with Rob numerous amount of times. And, uh, you know, for, for somebody like myself to come on the scene, debut, and give Rob a, a run for his money, and everybody knew I could wrestle, but Rob never, didn't know me. And uh, they were saying in the back, you think Vito can hang with Rob? They said, I hope Rob can hang with Vito because I was a machine. I could go like an amateur wrestler. I was, I was a beast. So me and him I, I had a good match. And, uh, we wrestled a couple more times. We wrestled on the road together. I really enjoyed him. He always just tell me, he said, Vito, I love working with you. I said, why is that? You're the only guy who catches me. <laughs> so, so that's good. 
Well, I, well for Rob, I'd, I'd certainly hope that uh, he had a few more opponents that caught him because uh, that's a lot of what he did. Um, the 16th of January, 1999, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You make your ECW pay-per-view debut at ECW House Party against Sid. Um I mean, for you now, okay, you've, you've, you've done some stuff on Hardcore TV. You've been on the live events. Now you get to make your pay-per-view debut. Uh, how exciting was this for you? Well, I was off that day, and Paul needed an opponent for Sid. He asked three people to wrestle Sid. They all turned him down. So really? he says, Vito, I, I, need a, I, need a, I need a favor. I said, what's up? He says, uh, I need somebody to wrestle Sid. And I said, okay. He says, you know what I want, right? I said, I, said, I know. And I said, I'm good. So I knew my job, and I only knew my job because of all the years of training and grooming and where I've come from and how to get somebody over. So I went in there, you know, and I did the job. I got stretched out. When I came back, everybody thought that I had gotten killed. And uh, everybody came running down to the curtain. They said, are you okay? because it wasn't scheduled that I was supposed to get stretched out. I did it on my own. <laughs> really? <laughs> so I, I worked the whole dressing room. I come back, Paul's going, oh my God, are you all right, Peter? I'm sorry. I said, is that okay? He said, is that what you wanted? He goes, you're not hurt. I said, no. I said, I'm fine. And that's, that's so the day they said, you know, hey, you've got a job and you're going to start flying. And everybody was clapping because like, everybody believed I got killed. Even Sid came back and said, oh, shit, I didn't mean to hurt the guy. But you couldn't hurt me. I was, I was, I was indestructible. And uh, they always told me, they said, Vito, if you would have fought back, that would have been a hell of a fist fight. That's awesome, man. That's a great little uh, little story there to throw in. I, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, so uh, after this, you're, you're working on the road with Balls Mahoney, Sabu, Taz, Jerry Lynn, Carino, the Dudleys, Rhino. Danny Doring, Spanish Angel. Um, that's just, geez, that, 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 that's such a great roster of people right there. Um, how, how are you fitting into the locker room in ECW during this time? Very good because I like the regimen. You come to the arena, you work out, have your match, um, get on the road. So it was like a, a regimen that was already a culture that was already set, a culture that I was accustomed to, a culture that I liked. So it was easy to do. There's no egos. You knew where your place was. And then when, all you got to do is wrestle. And everybody knew I could wrestle. I'm just waiting and doing my job and enjoying, enjoying the fact that I had a job and enjoying wrestling. That's cool, man. Um, 26th of June, 99 in Philly, uh, ECW Hostile City Showdown 99. You work with a guy known as Simon Diamond. I, uh, I know later on when you're in TNA, you reconvene with him there. Uh, is, is Simon a good friend of yours? Uh, Pat Kenny, uh, have you, what are your memories of working with him then? Uh, work with Pat Kenny. He was always, a, he was always a good guy. He was trying to make it in the business like everybody else. And you know, on, uh, at the time he was, he was dating Dawn Marie and, uh, you know, everybody thought because she was in the WWE that he was on his way and they're going to get a job there, but it didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, so you know, but he was a down-to-earth guy. You know, he did his thing. He was a good wrestler. You know, me and him always had good matches. So, I mean, it was no problem. Uh, in July of 99, there were a, a few events where you were teaming with C.W. Anderson. Were, were they thinking of, well, was Paul thinking of putting you and C.W. together as a tag team? And why did that tag team not end up becoming a thing? That's something I can't answer. It was just the booking one-on-one of Paul. You know, but I could say anything else, you, you know, if you could work and you could work with anybody and you can make anything good. Um, I, I don't remember the matches, but I know that it was, the matches were good because I never really had a bad match to where I could say, oh, my God, that was atrocious or was bad. So, I mean, anybody I work with, it was always a good effort and a good team effort. Cool, man. Um, soon after this is when the Baldies uh, put together. Um, do you know, or do you remember uh, any instances where this idea was first brought up? Well, they were looking for something for me to do, and they were looking for something for me to uh, put me somewhere because I had a good singles run. They didn't have a single spot open, so they put me with a group in the Baldies, and um, it was three other guys, Angel, DeVito, and PN News, 
we didn't have nothing going on and we became a good stable. The only regret, regret we, I have of that is if I would have stayed in ECW, that stable would have been probably one of the best of all time. Yeah, I, I've actually, uh, I've been watching ECW chronologically from when uh, ECW on TNN started airing in August of uh, 99. Uh, and I'm past now the point of uh, when you had left the group. And I, I really feel like just out of the gate, the Baldies really made a name for themselves just straight away, especially with this feud with New Jack. Um, you know, what are your memories of working with New Jack? Oh, working with Jerome was awesome, you know, and, um, you know, we all wanted to do good. So it, was, it wasn't like it was a, uh, you know, it was a, a, a hard party to deal with. You know, if we all believe, if one believes, we all believe. We, if one does hardcore, we all do hardcore. So it was all for, you know, we were all in it together. We understood what we had to do. And we had some good matches and we did some great things. So there was no qualms about anything. Cool. Um, I guess I want to kind of run through the guys in the group and, and how you feel about them and, and, and I guess... You know, what, what they mean to your career in ECW, um, Angel, Spanish Angel, uh, you know, how do you feel about him, him as a worker and as a friend? Well, well, me and Angel have been friends for 30 years. We're still friends today. And he started out at Johnny Rods' school. Oh, wow. So when, so when Angel first came around to ECW, they used to put, put him with me. And, I, you know, I always tried to put Angel. I said, Angel, this is what you got to do to get a job. This year. I know Angel always trusted me. I never guided him wrong. We were tagging before we, when we were working for Johnny Rods. We were boys. We were friends. We're still boys today. Um, I got no, no, no qualms about that. You know, he's one of my best friends. So I can't say anything bad about That's that. That's cool. Yeah, no, he seems like a great guy. Um, Tony DeVito, a guy who has uh, ignored several of my messages to uh, interview him for the podcast. Uh, what, what, uh, what was it like working with him? Tony DeVito was a hardworking guy. He used to do WW, um, WWF and WWE TVs. You know, he got a job the same way Angel did working with the ring crew. So, and you know, when he was with the Baldies, everything was good. I mean, he was a great guy, good family man. You know, everything was, you know, good. He liked working with the Baldies. You know, I got nothing bad to say. Uh, and, and Tony, I'm sure you're not watching this, but if you are, I want to interview you, my friend. Um, and uh, PN News, uh, I, I want to ask you about, about him because uh, just as things were going well with the feud with New Jack, you and PN News leave ECW after losing to Balls and Axel. I, I'm guessing you were leaving because you had been offered a contract with WCW, but I, I could not understand why he left too when he didn't go anywhere where uh, after that i um like i said if i would have stayed in the baldies that group would have stayed and we would have did great things yeah but when i got hired to go to wcw i think i was the cog i was the key the straw that stirred the drink with that group and once i left and he went back to germany um, right. I don't think they want, I think they didn't want to bring, keep him on. And then when you see Angel and DeVito together, they didn't have the same oomph as when Skull and PN News were there. Yeah. So, like I said, you know, and, that, and that's not a knock against the guys. And that wasn't a knock against anybody. No. It was just a career move and an opportunity for myself. But like I said, if I would have stayed, that group could have did some great things and we probably, you know, we probably could have been tag team champions. It could have been a TV championship. We could have been something and uh, we could probably could have held titles, you know, all of us. So, I mean, it was a great unit and a great unit never had a chance. Yeah. So you got to put it, you got to put a star next to it and a question mark to see how good we could have been. Uh, when you look back in your ECW experience, uh, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Um, hard work. I put a lot of hard work in there. And uh, uh, I came, I worked with a bunch of great guys. I worked with a team. We were all trying to make, we were all trying to make it in the, in the industry. And if you look at the roster of ECW guys, I would say more than half of us went on to work for WCW and WWE 
after our run in in the ECW. And for myself, I'm one of the few who actually work for ECW, WCW, TNA, and the WWE. Yeah, you got all of them under your belt. It's uh, something to definitely be proud of. And I'll and um, by the end of this podcast, there's something uh, very important that I want to say to you, but you have to wait for the end. Um, but uh, it, it, is your signing with WCW is is that is Vince Russo helping you out there? I know you were old friends before that. We were friends, but you know what? He offered me a job because he had a position for me. He didn't just give me a job to be his buddy. Absolutely. You know, a lot of pe- yeah. a lot of people get the wrong idea of giving somebody a job. You can give somebody a job, but that guy has to hold up his end of the bargain. Yeah. And uh, me signing with WCW, that was a good signing because I held my end of the bargain up. And I didn't ride in there and say, oh, Vince Russo's buddy. I worked and I yeah. worked hard. And I want to show people I was one of the best. So, yep. And and I I'll tell you what, man. Like uh, I've I've I'm just up to the part chronologically watching it back again, where it's just before Bischoff and Russo have their uh, first Nitro together. So I've seen that run up until that point. Thirteenth um, of December, nineteen ninety nine, in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. Your Nitro debut against Lash Larue, a guy that. We don't really hear much about these days, but I thought he was great. Um, how excited were you to be debuting on a Monday night try? Um, I, I can't tell you. I, it was a great thing. I mean, you know, like I said, I, I've been in the business. I've been on TV. I've been to the big time. And I guess it didn't hit me. You know, it's just funny. I, I, was, I was the guy who wrestled for companies. I wasn't an independent guy wrestling just indies. I was, a, I wrestled for companies. So I was in the realm where I was in the business, but I wrestled on the big stage for a good portion of my career. So that's why I look calm, confident. Um, I had some swag. I knew what I was doing, but it wasn't for the help. If it wasn't for the help of all the veterans, for which I say thank you to, for taking the time to teach me and groom me, I would never have been able to transition and do some of the great things I've done in the wrestling business. Right. And, and I have to say, um, you know, just, just from the outset, um, you know, you're put together with Johnny the Bull. Uh, just within a few weeks, it just feels like you guys had been there for, for a long time. It, it just it didn't take very long for the two characters to just connect very well on television to, to the viewer. No, it was... Uh, a natural thing for me because that's who I was. And Johnny was uh, very green, but he was very willing to learn. And he was a good student, but I didn't expose Johnny. So that's why it came off excellent. And Johnny did a bunch of great things. Johnny the Bull was, a, was ahead of his time because if he was wrestling today with that body, that power, that athleticism, he'd be world champion right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. That guy was... Uh, a great mix of power and the athleticism of the guy as well was just unbelievable. Um, so you, you formed the Mamelukes with Johnny the Bull. Uh, and so you, you kind of alluded to it earlier that you, they wanted to put Johnny with you because you were someone that could help teach him. Right. I was the quarterback. So, uh, how, you know, when you first met Johnny, you know, what were your first impressions of the guy? He was a nice kid. We became friends. We're still friends today. So, I mean, you know, and, uh, we talk and, um, you know, he, he was, a, it was just, a, it was something that clicked for us and you know, something that we became friends. That's cool, man. Um, so I guess this storyline is all kind of revolving around, uh, Tony Mamaluke, who was known as Tony Marinara, uh, during that time. Uh, what was it like working with Tony and do you, un- uh, do, or do you know why Tony all of a sudden just dropped out of the storyline? That's because he had a concussion and he never got it taken care of, and uh, they released him. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, now I know. Um, but was it all right working with him? Yeah, it was fine for the little bit that he was there. Uh, you guys feud with Disco Inferno and Lash Larue. Uh, that's kind of like the first feud that you your your team had. What was it like working with those guys? Everything was great. It was everybody wanted to do be good wrestling good tag team matches. And a lot of that match with a lot of Memphis style wrestling 
a lot of Memphis tag team wrestling, if you watch it back. And, you know, you didn't see that much of that kind of style. And that's what I learned how to be a good tag team wrestler from where I came from. And I said, guys, this is how we have to do it. This is tag team wrestling. Let's do the matches like this. So that's what we did. And they came off great. There was a, there was a promo that you and Johnny had where you were, you were cooking for these two, two women. Uh, I just thought this is <laughs> fucking hilarious. Um, the, the, there's a situation with you and, and Johnny where you, you're arguing in the kitchen because you're putting onions in the, in the pasta sauce. And uh, <laughs> uh, I just love this promo and especially at the end. And I said this to Noel um, not long ago when once I watched it and I said that I, I thought that I had, I had personally come up with the best ending for that promo, which didn't take place, but I was expecting it. The situation happens, you guys are covered in the sauce on the bed and Johnny's trying to talk to you and you're telling him to shut up and he's trying to talk to you and you're telling him to shut up. And I was expecting him to say, Vito, you were right about the onions because he was tasting yeah. the sauce. But it didn't That's happen. Pretty good. <laughs> it didn't happen though, but um, I, I, th I thought that, that, that promo was hilarious. Um, I want to know what it's like working with Vince Russo with all these ideas he's got for uh, the skits that you guys would do. I mean, it was his, it, you know, it was his vision from a movie and um, we played it to a T. He told me what the idea was, so we just acted accordingly. And, um, you know, we evolved from that to be, you know, really good characters and really good people. So, I mean, it was just a, a, a great thing. I love the uh, strip poker as well with the Nitro Girls. Just, this is some classic champagne television, if I do say so myself. Yeah, champagne television. <laughs> um, Disco joins uh, the, the, the crew. Uh, so you, you're a team of three. He's your manager now. Um, you know, tell, me, tell me a story about working with Disco Inferno. Uh, Clem was a funny guy. You know, he was always into, he was really into the wrestling business, you know, Nunk. He was not a, a fighting guy. He just had a, you know, a sense of humor you had to have a case for. But overall, nice guy. Nothing wrong with Duquan at all. Um, so just over a month in, and you win the WCW Tag Team Championship on January 18th in Evansville, Indiana, on an edition of Thunder against David Flair and Crowbar. You're not there that long, but already your hard work has paid off with Johnny. You're both tag team champions. That must have been a great feeling. That was a great feeling. Kevin Sullivan was in charge. He said, it's time for a change. So they put the straps on us and, you know, off we went. I mean, it was a great, great night for us and for Johnny and I. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you have a few with the Harris brothers. Uh, and what was, the, you know, how was that working with the, those two big guys? Not, uh, you know, uh, you asked me, like, you know, uh, everything was fine working with everybody in there. there I, we never had a problem with working with anybody. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it was business. It was work, you know, and everybody took to what we had to do. So, I mean, you know, it was uh, a very good, very good experience working with everybody in WCW. Cool. Yeah, sorry, I, I keep asking about how it was working with everyone. Um, but uh, uh, the new blood storyline takes place. Um, Disco leaves the team. Um, you know, how did you feel about that new blood storyline? You go with the flow. You go with what they put in front of you. It's not, you know, you're working, you're having a good, you're, you're just enjoying wrestling. And, you know, you really don't have a say when it comes to the booking, what they hand out. So you just uh, you go and do what you got to do. You uh, kind of uh, get more involved in the, the hardcore division around this time. Um, the, uh, the team splits up. Did you want to split the team up or did you think that the team had a bit more of a run left in it? If we would have kept on what we were doing, we probably had more of a run, but they were going in so many different directions with the, who was booking. That's why it kind of got derailed. And uh, putting me in the hardcore division, I consider myself one of the best hardcore wrestlers that there were that there have been i put myself in the top 10 if we had a top 10 so um you know uh, i just we just take it and you run with it and you do what you got to do to make things happen i mean from what i remember me personally and maybe i'm just biased because i'm a fan of yours but i thought you were the best wcw hardcore champion that they had 
Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I really do. Um, so after you've uh, split with Johnny, you feud with Johnny. Um, right. How was it working with him? You know, is he, you know, are you, are you still teach him the ropes at this point? And uh, how, how do you feel that went? I think Johnny learned very, I think Johnny uh, worked well. And I think Johnny did great. Um, he learned good. He was uh, doing okay. I mean, you know, what can I say? It was a learning experience for him, learning experience for everybody. You know, because now you, you're, you're working for yourself. You're working to teach. You're trying to make it up the ranks. So, you know. I, th I think uh, the, the good thing about this was, though, that you guys rightfully reunite before the end of WCW. Because as a fan, in my opinion, I really felt like that team should never have uh, broken up. It should have always been together. Um, how do, you how do you start to find out that things aren't going well with WCW and that the company is going to get sold? Um, I, uh, you just find out. We knew it was going to get sold. And then uh, <clears throat> you just, um, you know, you really didn't have much to say. You just had to go with what was happening. And, uh, you know, you really can't say anything. You just knew that it was going to be sold. And you really didn't know. So it was kind of a shock to everybody. Well, there we have it, everyone. My exclusive interview there with Big Vito from two and a half years ago. You got to see me once again from the early stages of the podcast. And obviously, you've seen how much I've grown as an interviewer since then. Um, so I want to thank all of you out there for taking the time to watch this. And I want to thank Big Vito for his time two and a half years ago uh, to sit down with me and have a conversation. It really meant a lot to me. So thank you all once again, and we will see you down the road. Thank you.